All right, we are finishing our series on the book of James. How many of y'all have enjoyed just going through the book of James? I have loved this series. If you missed any of it, go back and watch it, listen to it. But if you have a Bible, turn to James chapter five. James chapter five. We are in the final chapter, final week of this series. And don't miss Mother's Day next weekend. Make sure you get something special for the moms in the room. We'll have something special as a church. And then the week after Mother's Day is Pentecost weekend. We're going to do water baptisms that week after Mother's Day. It's going to be powerful. Don't miss Pentecost weekend. James chapter five. If you're there, make a shout. Yeah, come on. We shout for the word of God. James five. And I want to start with verse 17. So James was talking and James needed to remind himself and remind the church that the people God used to do extraordinary things, they were ordinary people just like us. And he writes in this verse something that really stood out to me. It grabbed my my heart this year as I was reading the book of James way before the series started. I was reading this book in January. And I came across this verse, and this was the verse that wanted, really made me want to preach the series on the book of James. And so in verse 17, it says, Elijah was a human just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed in verse 18, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. But I want to go back to verse 17. I want to title this message, Human Just Like Us. Turn to the person next to you and say, these guys were humans just like us. Lord, speak to us from that word today. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. What, what James was trying to say is that God takes ordinary people and he does extraordinary things through them. God takes regular human beings like you and me, and he does supernatural things through them. I was sitting in a cabin earlier this year in Louisiana. I'd been invited by Pastor Larry Stockstill, who is a pastor in my life. He often comes comes and speaks in our church. He asked me to come on a hunting trip with him. And I was like, I'm not a good hunter. But he said, just come and enjoy the fellowship. There's other pastors coming. So I come out there, and we're in Louisiana. We're staying in this cabin out in the woods, and all these guys have their hunting gear. And then I start getting to know all the guys in in the room. And I start realizing these are pastors of major churches across America and across the world. I mean, right next to me was a guy named Russell Evans, who pastors one of the largest churches in the world in Australia. And then next to him was Robert Morris, who pastors Gateway Church. And he starts talking about how in one year they gave $100 million to missions and local outreach. I was like, $100 million. I mean, it was just unbelievable. And then next to him was Tommy Barnett, a guy who started the bus ministry that changed the way local churches did outreach. He's the one that initiated the very first dream center in Los Angeles and then Phoenix and then inspired my dad to build one here. And Tommy Barnett's sitting there. And then I start meeting these pastors who pastor churches with like 100,000 plus people in their churches all over the world. And I was like, I can't believe I'm invited to this. Who am I to be sitting in a room with all these mighty men of God? And Tommy Barnett gets up in front of the group of pastors. There's like 50 of us there. And there's a bonfire going. And he says, guys, I want to tell you something. He says, I've been in ministry for 60 plus years. And he said, I used to think that God only used extremely holy, perfect, mighty men and women of God. He said, in fact, all my life I admired and I even felt so unqualified looking up to my heroes like John G. Lake and Oral Roberts and Billy Graham and Smith Wigglesworth and then people like Amy Simple McPherson and Catherine Kuhlman. And I'm like Googling all these names. I'm like, I think I know who these people are, but I'm, I want to make sure I got all the details and I'm realizing these are people that raised dead people back to life. These are people that started movements that built universities. By the way, Oral Roberts University is one of the greatest universities. I'm an alumni. Any any students or alumni in the house? I mean, to, to, to be in that space next to him. And Tommy said, one day I was invited to speak at a conference and it was in Europe. And he said, I was sitting on the stage and he said, the first speaker that would speak was Billy Graham. He said, I'm in my 40s. And he was like, Billy Graham was like, you know, he was Jesus. It was like, he was perfect. He was holy. He was the most brave human being in the world. He was like a superhuman. And then he said, next to Billy Graham was Oral Roberts. He said, next to Oral Roberts 
was Ulf Ekman, who pastored this massive church in Europe and built this incredible movement across Sweden and Norway. He said next to him was Dr. Young E. Cho, the pastor of the largest church in the world. A million people are in his congregation in Seoul, South Korea. He said then next to him was Reinhard Bonnke, who had done crusades in Africa where a million people in one day got saved and dead people who had been dead for days came back to life. And then he said, here's me, 40-year-old Tommy Barnett. He said, I got a bus ministry. What am I doing here? And he said, I thought, man, I am so unqualified next to these super mighty heroes of the faith. He said, then Billy Graham said, Tommy, can you come backstage with me? He said, I was for sure Billy Graham was going to read my mail and tell me how big of a sinner I was and, you know, how unqualified I was to be on stage. But he said he pulled me backstage and had a tear in his eye and said, I just don't think I can preach today. And Tommy was like, what do you mean? He said, there's a lot going on in my family and I feel real anxious right now. Tommy, would you pray for me? Tommy said, all of a sudden, my superhero took his cape off. He said, it's like I... I thought this guy was untouchable. I thought this guy never had a bad thought in his life, that he never had an anxious feeling, that he was perfect, that his family was perfect, that his kids never had problems. He said, suddenly my hero became human. And he said, I could feel the humanity of Billy Graham. He said, whoa, I'm, I'm like you. I got issues too. I, I don't feel good, good enough to preach today. And Billy said, but I need you to pray for me, Tommy. So Tommy was like, okay, I'll pray for you. He said, then Billy Graham preached and it was incredible. He said, then Oral Roberts came up to him after he got done preaching and said, man, I, I feel like I just blew it. I feel like I, I didn't preach that good of a sermon. I, I messed up my stories, messed up my notes. And Tommy Barnett's sitting there. He's like, Oral Roberts, you're like one of the greatest communicators ever. He's like, here he is just admitting his insecurity to me. He said, I thought I was the only preacher who thought I messed up my sermons. But here Oral Roberts starts admitting, I just did terrible up there. Then Dr. Cho sits down and says, would you pray? My kids are going through stuff right now. Ryan Hart Bonke starts talking about problems in his life. He said, one by one, all of my heroes on stage took off their mask, took off their cape, and showed that they were human just like us. And he said, I, I left that conference and I realized, and he's telling all these pastors this in a cabin earlier this year. He says, I want you guys to know there's no one in this room that's a superhuman or that's super holy or that's never made a mistake in their life or that's never struggled or tempted or fallen in temptation or, you know, lived the most flawless life. He said, we're all human and we all need grace and we all need help. And yet God has done some supernatural, extraordinary things through humans. Say it with me, just like us. I love that James gives us a glimpse into Elijah's life. And he says, listen, Elijah, he was a prayer warrior but he was also human. One of my favorite stories about Elijah is not when Elijah called fire down from heaven and got rid of all the false gods and got rid of all the Baal worshipers. It's not when Elijah prayed for the rain to stop and it stopped. It's not when Elijah raised a dead person back to life. One of my favorite stories about Elijah is 1 Kings 19, it says Elijah was afraid and he ran for his life. And I think that's an interesting part of Elijah's journey. And yet Jesus talks about Elijah in the New Testament as if Elijah never had a problem. Like Jesus has Elijah on the mountain of transfiguration when Jesus changes himself and on the mountain, like Moses appears, Elijah appears, God speaks to literally Peter and James and John, all these people. And Jesus has Elijah right there. People talked about Elijah in the New Testament like he never had a problem. But if you read his story, Elijah struggled with depression at times. Elijah struggled with discouragement at times. Elijah even had moments where he wanted to quit the ministry. He was done, and yet God wasn't finished with him. And I love that James tells us this guy was human just like us. I remember being at my parents' house when Oral Roberts came over to have lunch at our house. And my dad had always talked about how Oral Roberts was his mentor, that he had literally like built this incredible university and inspired so many people to change the world. And I was so intrigued. I was like eight or nine years old. I kid you not, he was sitting on the couch in my parents' house. We had a blue and white striped couch. He's sitting there and I was just mesmerized. I was like, he is not a human. He is like someone from heaven. I was like, this man built the baseball stadium over there. The maybe center. This like, it was just incredible. The cityplex towers. I was like this. And I got so close to him. And then I was amazed at how big his ears were. And I looked at him. I said, Mr. Oral. He looked at me like I was an idiot. He was like, yeah. I go, can I touch your ears? 
And he was like, well, sure, son. So I start just touching his ears. And he's just looking at me like, who's this creep over here, Billy Joe? And my dad's just looking at me like, son, get your hands off Oral's ears. But I was so amazed by him. I was so amazed by him. And he looks at me and he goes, you know, I'm human, just like you. And I say this to say, because we read our Bible and we read these stories and we're like, this is impossible. We couldn't, we couldn't do what these guys do. And James says, yes, you can. You can pray like Elijah prayed. You can, you can live with the courage that Esther lived with. You can walk around walls like Joshua walked around. You can pray for the sun to stand still. You can do the supernatural because you're human just like Elijah. God doesn't call perfect people. God doesn't call holier than thou people. God calls ordinary people like Dr. Cho and Lester Sumrall and Billy Graham and Oral Roberts and Kenneth Hagin and Amy Simple McPherson and Catherine Coleman and you too. Somebody say he calls you too. He calls you too. Here's why this matters. Because we go through life thinking I couldn't ask for that or I I feel like I'm unqualified. And it's important for us to remember not to lose hope in ourselves and not to lose hope in others. It's important for us to dream big dreams. Tommy said something. He said, after I met these guys, I started dreaming on a higher level because I I realized these guys are human just like me and they built things that I'm not praying to build. And he said, I went back home and said, God, if they can do it and they're human and they got human issues just like me, then you could do it in Phoenix, Arizona. And I believe God could do it in Tulsa, Oklahoma. If God did it for a human like Billy Joe, he can do it for a human like Paul David Darty. He can do it for you. Let's stop limiting what God can do in us and through us and others just because we think certain people have more than us. It's time to pray bigger prayers, dream bigger dreams, take bigger risks. I want to look at James chapter five through the lens of James being a human, just like us, and challenging us with 10 practical points of how to live our lives for God, how to live our lives in light of the calling of God. So if you're taking notes, note takers are history makers, world changers, culture shapers. Just write this 10 lessons from a human just like us. 10 lessons from a human just like us. Number one, we read in James chapter five, verse one through five, that people who trust in their riches will eventually fail, that these riches will crush them. In fact, he says in verse one, rich people weep and wail because of the misery that's coming your way. Wealth is going to rot. Moths will eat away your clothes. Eventually your silver and gold will be corroded. What's he saying? He's saying, number one, here's the lesson. It's okay to have stuff, but it's not okay for stuff to have you no idols. This is the calling of God on the church, that it's not bad to have wealth, but it's bad for wealth to have you. Wealth can become a cage and you become a slave to money. I'll never forget sitting next to this wealthy man 10 plus years ago on an airplane. And I was sitting in economy and he was sitting back there. I was sitting like on the 20th row. And he said, he starts telling me about the businesses he started. He was like a serial entrepreneur. I mean, he had started all these companies, owned all these real estate businesses and I said, I don't think this is true because if this was true, you'd be sitting in first class. And I I, like, I kind of called him on his bluff. I was like, you would own your own jet. You would have like, you're talking like you're a multi, multi millionaire. He said, well, Google my name. So I Googled it. I was like, is that really your name? He goes, look at the images of the picture of that name. I go, that is you. You're not lying. This is true. I said, why are you sitting back here? He said, I I really hate spending money on stuff like this. And um, he had a lot more to say. There was a lot of cuss words mixed in there. But he said, uh, he said, what do you do? I said, I'm a pastor. He goes, ah, God stuff, church stuff. I said, you go to church? He goes, no. And he said a couple of cuss words with it. And then I said, um, do you give to, to help any charities? He goes, no. He's like, they don't deserve it. They didn't earn it. He's like, this is my money. I made this money. He goes, I love money. Money can, he said, money is everything. Money can buy you anything you want. He starts talking about money, 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 money. And then as I start to dig a little bit longer, we're on that plane for three hours. I was going to preach in in, uh, another state and I start talking to him about his life and he's on his fourth marriage. He doesn't talk to certain kids that he had and he's lost relationship with a lot of people. He's not super happy with where his life's ended up, but he loves his money. And I started realizing, you know, money can do a lot of things, but money can't save your soul. And at the end of the day, This is what Jesus had a lot of wealthy people that walked with him and he wasn't against them having wealth. In fact, there were people who funded the ministry of Jesus 
And he was good with that. He said, hey, listen, be blessed. Keep a generous eye. Make sure that you don't hoard your blessing for yourself, but that you share it with the poor and that you keep a selfless heart to build the kingdom of God. He wasn't against people having a house or having wealth or having resources, but when it had them, it had become an idol. Number two, it's okay to enjoy life, but greed, pride, and self-reliance will rob you in the end. This is why Jesus said, store treasures in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy, where thieves can't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be. So James says, it's okay to enjoy life, but the problem is there are people, and James is talking to people who had left the church, who had walked away from God and put their trust in riches. He said, listen, the wages that you failed to pay your employees are crying against you. You have spent your lives in luxury. You have lived on earth all for yourself and your pride and your greed and your arrogance in your riches is ultimately going to destroy you. You will be self-destroyed by your self-reliance. When you think, I remember talking to that guy on the plane, he said, I'm a self-made success story. I did it all by myself. I don't need God. I don't need the church. And when we get to that point, we're robbing ourselves of real life. Real life is not found in what we can do for ourselves. It's found in putting our trust in the one who did it all for us on the cross, who paid the price for our sin and our salvation and our freedom. The gospel sets me free from pride and greed and self-reliance. And it reminds me every good and perfect gift comes from above. And I'm a steward of what God's given me. It's okay to enjoy life, but don't let greed, pride, and self-reliance rob you in the end. Then James goes on to say in verse seven, be patient, my brothers and sisters, be patient because Jesus is coming back soon. Watch as the farmer waits for the harvest. He waits in the land for the land to yield its crops, patiently waiting for the autumn and the spring rains. So number three, learn the art of patience and playing the long game. You're sitting in a room that took 27 years to build 27 years. Now, we didn't start construction 27 years before it was built, but my dad had a dream in 1981 that one day Victory would have its own building. And yet, God gave him this conviction in his heart to build on a cash basis, debt-free. And there was a lot of pastors who kind of insulted him and said, Billy Joe, just borrow from the bank, borrow from the bank, just do what you want to do, just get it done fast, and then pay it off over the next 20, 30 years. But he had this conviction, we're going to build on a cash basis, we're going to do it debt free. For 25 years, we were a mobile church, renting the Maybe Center across the street every single Sunday, until March 4th, 2007, this building was paid in full, debt free. We moved into the building. I'll never forget just seeing my dad with tears in his eyes, rejoicing. Because patience pays off. Patience pays off. We are a microwave generation serving a crockpot God. We want God to do it fast. We're like, I want to get married now. I want to have kids now. I want my miracle now. I want my school paid off now. And God says, if you wait, if you play the long game, you will have a much greater reward and your character will be so much more sustainable for the position that you are begging to have right now. What if God is preserving you from the promotion because you're not ready to handle it? If you got it now, if you got what you want now, you might squander it. So God says, wait, because what I'm doing in you is more important than what's happening to you. And what God, like God cares more about your soul than he does your salary. God cares more about your character than he does your promotion or your platform or your social media following. Followers. God cares more about preserving you so that you actually live longer with a sustainable peace and joy that that salary, that platform. So he says, wait, learn the art of patience. I remember hearing a story about a guy named Jason Weaver, 1994. He was an actor for the Disney Channel and they hired him to be a voice for Simba on a movie called Lion King. Come on. Don't make me start singing Lion King. I could go. I could go there right now. Awesome layers and I'm easing you. The circle of life. I got the whole soundtrack memorized, but here's the point. Jason Weaver was 14 years old. 1994, they said, we will offer you $1 million for you to sing four songs on the Lion King movie. You get to sing, oh, I just can't wait to be king. You get to sing Akuna Matata. You get to sing, uh, uh, can you feel the love tonight? You get to sing, like there's like four songs. This 14-year-old kid, $1 million. But his mom said, don't take it. She said, we're going to play the long game. She went to Disney and she said, we don't want a check right now. We want royalties. We want 5% on every song that he's on 
that gets sold and played in any store radio station. And they said, that, that may not pay off very much. I mean, take the million dollars right now. The short game, you get money right now. You get the microwave money. She said, no, we're playing the long game. We're gonna wait this out. They calculated in 2023, he had made 40 times more what he made, would have made if he took the temporary check. Somebody say, wait for it. James says, wait like a farmer. A farmer knows that harvest is coming. A farmer knows that seasons eventually end and the next season begins. A farmer understands that the autumn rains and the spring rains, April showers bring May flowers. So he trusts and he doesn't wait with a lazy spirit. The art of patience doesn't mean you're just sitting there watching Netflix doing nothing. It's a patience with action. It's a patience saying, God, work in me. I'll serve in the church. If you're single and you're waiting to get married, you're not just sitting back saying, one of these days, my mister's gonna complete me. One of these days, my missus is gonna complete me. No, 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 you are already complete in Christ. You are serving in the church. You're showing up. You're living in your purpose. You're doing what God designed you to do. And on the journey of patience and action, and faith. Hebrews chapter 6 says our ancestors, Abraham, they, they inherited the promises of God through faith and patience. He says, listen, if you'll wait for it and you'll expect and you'll trust and you'll hope, God will bring it about. And then he says this in verse 8, you too be patient and establish your hearts in Christ because Jesus is coming soon. So number four, Number four, focus on establishing your heart in Christ. Focus on establishing your heart. What does that mean? That means my heart is not set on my position, my title, or even my miracle. My heart is set on Christ. And if I'll establish my heart on Christ and guard my heart against all these fleshly things that are coming against me, James is saying, listen, I'm human just like you. My heart gets attacked left and right. I get anxious, I get worried, I get frustrated, I get tempted. I feel like a comparison trap with Peter and, and John and all the other disciples. James says, but get your heart established. Get your identity established on Christ. And then he says this in the next verse. He says in verse, um, verse 9, he says, listen, don't grumble against each other. Don't criticize each other. Don't judge each other. Or you too will be judged. And the judge stands at the door. He says, listen, the judge is waiting there. So he says, be careful the way you talk about your brothers and sisters in Christ. And then in verse 10, he says, brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job. Job was a human just like us. So here's my next point right here. Number five, remember Job, persevere and trust God for his grace in your life. Job was a human just like us, and he lost everything. I mean, he lost his, he lost his kids. He lost his house. I was talking this past week with a pastor, and he said, I went through the worst season of my life during COVID. He said, I lost my best friend. I lost my dog. He said, it felt like a country song. I just was losing everything. He said, but in the middle of that, he said, in the middle of that, God gave me some of the greatest joy. He said, one night, my wife and I, we were crying over the amount of loss we were walking through as, as a couple and as with our friends and just life. And he said, in the tears, all of a sudden it turned into laughter because he said it was just like unbelievable how much loss we had walked through. But he said, the laughter it turned into joy. It wasn't flipping. It wasn't shallow. It was like joy that God is with us. God is teaching us the art of perseverance, that God is strengthening our character. You know, one guy came up to me. I was preaching in Detroit, Michigan this last week. He came up to me. He said, there's a lot of bandwagon fans in the NFL. He said, they jump on a team when the team's up and they're winning. But he said, I've been a Lions fan from the beginning. He said, I was a li I've been a Lions fan on the worst years ever. He said, real fans, they stay with it. They stick with it even when the team's losing. And this is what James is saying. He's saying, listen, remember Job. Even when you're losing, don't run away from God. If you will turn to God, if you will worship God, if you will trust in God, God has grace. God has a reward. God has restoration. He's going to give you double for your trouble. But he asks you to persevere. He says, remember Job's perseverance and remember that God is full of mercy and compassion. So stick with it because he's human just like you. He went through loss. Anyone in this room went through loss before? Went through some pain? Yeah, we've all been there before. And he says, listen, when you're going through that, remember Job and hold on to hope. Hold on to that perseverance. In verse 12, he says, above all, brothers and sisters, don't swear. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. So number six, from a human just like us, he says, let your yes be yes 
and your no be no. What does that mean? It means let's be people of our word. If you say you're going to do something, do it. If you're not going to do it, don't do it. But don't live in this fickle, flaky, up and down, bipolar, back and forth. I don't know if I want to do this. I don't know. Be reliable. If you say you're going to do something, do it. James says, let's be people of our word. Let's, let's not take the name of God in vain. Let's not swear. Let's not make all these oaths. Let's just be people. If we say yes, let's do it. If we say no, let's don't. Verse 13, he says, is any one of you in trouble? Let them pray. If you're in trouble, pray. He says, is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of joy. In other words, if you're in hard times, pray. If you're in good times, praise. Either way, look to God. Because life is a rhythm of ebbs and flows, hills and valleys. Following Jesus is sunshine on one day and rain on the next day. Props to you for coming to church in the rain today. Come on, you showed up on a rainy day. But here's what James is saying. He's saying, when life is hard, pray. When life is good, praise. Don't forget that God is with you on the hard days and the good days. And then he says, if you're sick, in verse 14, if you're sick, call on the elders of the church. Let them know you're sick, and they will pray over you and anoint you with oil in the name of the Lord. Can I get one of those little bottles of oil? We're going to pray today over anyone who wants to be anointed with oil. We're going to bring back some old school stuff in the church these days. People have gotten so out of it, and I'm like, we got to get back to the real stuff. There's power in the name of Jesus. There's power in the oil. This is what James said. He said, have people anoint them with oil. Oil is such a spiritual symbol in the Bible. When you look at oil in the Old Testament, the New Testament, David said, my cup runneth over. Oil upon his head. When when Samuel anointed David as the next king of Israel, he put oil on his head. It's a sign of anointing. It's a sign of joy. It's a sign of God's hand is marking you. Some of you need to get marked by God today. But what Elijah is saying here is, number seven, pray, worship, and ask for prayer from the church. Pray, worship, and ask for prayer from the church. We gather every Sunday to pray to worship, to hear the word of God, and then ask for prayer if you need prayer. Growing up in our church, we always have people turn and pray for each other. And I remember when I was younger, I I used to sit by this one guy who's no longer here anymore, but uh, I used to sit by him and I'd say, do you need prayer for anything? He'd go, nope, doing great. Great, 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 great. Everything's good. Don't need prayer. Don't even ask me for prayer. It's embarrassing that you ask me for prayer. So I was like, okay, I'm not gonna pray for you. He's like, I don't need you to lay hands on me. I'm perfect. All is well. I'm righteous. I'm holy. I'm the greatest. I was like, okay, Jesus, you know, this guy thought he was amazing. Turns out a couple years later, this guy was hiding some major issues that were going on. I don't know why people hide either sickness or sin. I think it's shame. Shame keeps us in this place. Guilt is about what you've done. Shame is about who you are. Guilt is your due, shame is your hue. And, 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 and when you're guilty of something, you confess and you repent and you receive forgiveness and you know who you are in Christ. But when you're ashamed, you hide it. Shame causes us to hide it. It's why Adam and Eve hid in the garden. We don't want anyone to know what we're going through. People even hide sickness these days. I don't, I don't want anyone to know I'm battling cancer. I don't want anyone to know. And yet, how can the church pray for you if you won't admit that you need prayer? How can we anoint you with oil if you don't even want to be, you don't want it because, well, Paul, if people find out I'm human, yeah, just like us. Well, if people find out I got issues, you mean issues like Elijah? Yeah. If people find out I'm going through hard times, you mean just like Job? Well, if people feel, find out that I've sinned, you mean just like Peter? Well, everyone in the Bible needed prayer. So what makes you think you don't need prayer? Everyone in the Bible needed the oil. Everybody in the Bible needed the elders. to. Live. There is power. I'm always asking the elders. I'm always asking, Lord, pray for me. God, I want, I want every person that's got a spiritual anointing. I want people to pray for I want, I want. My dad used to have all the pastors that came through lay hands on us as kids. He said, pray for all my kids. Pray for Paul. He needs peace. He's got chaos. And I was like, lay it on me, you know, and they're praying for me. And I was like, as a church, how can you get prayer if you won't ask for it? Elijah says, ask for it. Verse 15, the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. In about 10 minutes here, we're going to pray with oil. If you want it, I'm going to have elders in the church line up in front of the stage. We're going to pray for every person that wants to be prayed for with the anointing of oil. Get ready. Get ready. So pray. And he says, the prayer made in faith will make the sick person well. 
healing flows. The Lord will raise them up. And if they have sin, they will be forgiven. There's forgiveness of sins when you come to God. If you've missed it, by the way, James isn't talking to pagans. He's not talking to non-Christians. He's talking to us because as Christians, we miss it sometimes. I'm not even going to ask by a show of hands how many of y'all have missed it in the last year because I already know the truth. We all have in some way. And you might go, well, Paul, I've not messed up that bad. I haven't done anything. I mean, a little bit of anger, maybe a bad word in my head or a bad thought. But, but James is saying, bring it to God. Bring it. Reveal it. You can't heal what you won't reveal. Whatever stays hidden stays unhealed. So, so James says in verse 16, confess your sins to each other. Pray for each other so that you may be healed. He's not saying go on Instagram or TikTok and announce to your whole following, I've sinned. He's saying, go to the right people in the church. Go to the elders. Go to someone at the altar. Stop acting like you're perfect and you never sin and you don't have problems. Just go to somebody and receive your healing. Receive your deliverance. Receive your victory. Receive the anointing of God. Number eight, confession and repentance opens the door for healing. We're talking about 10 lessons from a human just like us. And he says, if you'll confess, if you'll open up, he says, healing will flow. He says, you'll pray for each other and healing will flow. And the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. The prayer, by the way, my righteousness doesn't come from what I've done. My righteous acts are filthy rags. That's Isaiah the prophet. He said that. He said, listen, anything we try to do good for God, it will never be enough to pay for our sins. But the righteousness that comes from the blood of Jesus Christ, because he died on the cross for my sins, I am redeemed. So when God looks at Paul, even though I'm flawed and I stumble and I'm not the perfect pastor out there, he doesn't look at me and go, oh, there's flawed Paul. He goes, that's righteous Paul. That's redeemed Paul. That's Paul that's been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's Saint Paul. Every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. And you're here today and I'm telling you right now, if you'll call on God, his mercy is here. His grace is here. And, and, he, and James says, listen, if you'll confess, if you'll repent, healing will flow. Verse 17, Elijah was a human just like us. He prayed that it wouldn't rain, and it didn't rain. And then he prayed that it would rain in verse 18, and the rain poured out. Number nine, the prayers, the fervent prayers of the righteous avail much. God can do anything. You're sitting in a debt-free ministry today. God can do the impossible. If God used a human like Billy Joe, and God used a human like Oral Roberts, and God used humans just like the people around this room, to do supernatural things, he can do something great in you. That story of Kayla, the testimony, that like the family she grew up in, the pain she walked through, the amount of things that happened to her, and then to see her smiling with joy, only God can do that. Only God, the the fervent prayers of the righteous avail much. Friends, let's pray for the supernatural. Let's pray for miracles. Let's believe for God to turn our nation upside down with revival. Then he says this in verse 19, my brothers and sisters, if anyone in the church wanders from the truth, because it happens, prodigal sons leave the father's house sometimes. But James says, if you'll go after them, we got to always have one eye on the presence of God in this room and one eye on the prodigal outside of this room. If we got both eyes just on what God's doing in this room, We're going to be so excited that we forget there's lost sheep out there. There's people that need Jesus. There's people in our city that have left the church and they're not going anywhere. And you go, well, well, let's just let them live their life and maybe they'll come back. We got to go after them. We got to love them. We got to pray for them. We got to find them. We got to encourage them. We got to speak hope over them. Never give up on a lost sheep. Never give up on a lost son. Never give up on a lost dad. Never give up on a lost sister. Never give up on a lost wife. Never give up on a lost husband. Never give up on a person because God doesn't give up on you and he doesn't give up on them. And so James says, listen, go after Number 10, go after the lost and help turn them back. In verse 21, he says, whoever turns back a prodigal son, a prodigal husband, a prodigal wife, a prodigal daughter. Whoever turns a person back will save them from death and cover a multitude of sins. How beautiful is that? That God does a work in them, but God does a work in you. Will you stand to your feet all over this place? Y'all, we just finished the book of James. We just went through every verse in the whole book. If you missed any of the series, go back and listen to it. But I want to end today with prayer at this altar. Before you leave, I'm, I'm telling you right now, this is the most powerful moment in service. Last night, we spontaneously called an audible and we just started praying with oil we went to the kitchen we found all the oil we could find 
And what happened was tears and healing and restoration and grace and forgiveness and confession and repentance. In the nine name service, same thing. You might be here today and you need prayer. And maybe you're going, I just don't know if I want to go down to the front because I don't know that I want to show my humanity. I don't know that I want to be that vulnerable. I don't know. I mean, I'm a, I've been following Jesus for 15, 20 years. I've been in church, Bob, good. But there's something powerful about coming to the altar and just saying, God, I want your anointing on my life. God, I want your forgiveness in my heart. God, I want you to wash me, purify me. Maybe you need prayer for your marriage. Maybe you need prayer for your kids. Maybe you're a kid and you need prayer for your parents. Maybe you're a grown adult and you have a, a grown parent that's living with you and you're going, man, I just need prayer for them. Like it's, it's really hard. There's things going on. I just need prayer. I need the elders to pray for me. I need prayer for what I'm walking through in school, my finances. I need prayer to stop living with so much worry and anxiety. Maybe you need prayer to get free of depression. Maybe you've been battling an addiction to sin, habitual sin. You go, man, I just need prayer. I just need to get free. I want to walk in this. Today is your day. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. So today, take a step out from your seat. Let's fill this altar. Let's fill the aisles and let's pray and let's anoint each other with oil and let's believe that the same God who moved through a human like us, Elijah, wants to move through humans here today, that God is not finished with you yet. So we're gonna worship and we're gonna pray and we're gonna believe that the supernatural can happen on ordinary people just like us. Let's worship in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Renew. 
renewing you, transforming you. So I trust in my Savior.
we lift up every situation represented at this altar. We lift up every person, their testimony, their story, the areas, God, that they are trusting in you, counting on you. Lord, I thank you that you are more than able. You are more than able. Who am I to deny what the Lord can do? Let's just sing that again one more time. You are more than able. for every family that's healing in Jesus' name. God's hand is on you. He's more than able. He loves you. He sees you. His hand is on you. You're going to make it in Jesus' name. The devil is with you.
Come on, let's get our hopes up in the Lord today. just imagine Elijah on the day that he was praying for the rain to come back because the land had been in a famine and the Bible says that he crawled up to a mountaintop and he got on his knees and he began to pray and he did that seven times he would pray and then he would look out to see if the clouds had changed if rain was coming and finally after the seventh time he asked his assistant he said have you seen any rain clouds he said there's a small cloud the size of my hand don't get your hopes up Elijah and Elijah said, you better get ready because the, the rain, I hear the abundance. I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. There's a thunderstorm coming and it's a rain of God's favor and it's a rain of God's mercy and it's a rain of God's provision and it's a rain of God's protection and it's a rain of God's revival on the land. Lord, I pray for every person here today. God, that we would see ourselves the way you see us that you see us as righteous, you see us as children of God, and you said, ask, ask for the nations, ask with bold prayers. So God, we come to you today with faith, Lord, with bold faith, asking you to move in our lives. God, we ask you for healing. We ask you, God, for miracles and marriages and families and finances in places where it feels hopeless. God, I thank you that today you are the God who breathes fresh life, resurrection life. For someone who's just felt like giving up on God, someone who's in the room that's just wanted to throw in the towel on life, I thank you that today, God, you're saving their life. You're snatching them from that spirit of defeat. And God, you're breathing hope and victory into their life. Lord, that you're renewing minds today, minds that have been tormented by demonic strongholds, that today the devil is defeated. The devil is defeated. Lord, I thank you, God, that today, God, you are reclaiming back people's minds and hearts for you. Just say this with me. Say, Jesus, I surrender to you. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I repent. I need you, Jesus. I receive your forgiveness. You are my Lord. You rose from the grave. And resurrection power lives in me. God, you're not finished with my story. My best days are right in front of me. And I have victory in my life because Jesus lives in me. So Lord, I thank you that the devil is defeated. And I'm going to walk in victory. And I'm going to trust in you because you're doing something good in me. So Lord, have your way in my life, through my life, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.